As a young kid, probably from the age of about nine till I was 16, I, I delivered newspapers. One of the first things I would do when I'd get my newspapers, I would, I would sort of thumb through them, get exposed to the various news stories, and um, it, was a, it was just part of my ritual. So from that perspective, I was introduced to propaganda and, uh, and pulp information, uh, news, and I sort of developed an obsession with it. I got my bachelor's degree from Colorado State University in printmaking, and then my master's degree at Pennsylvania State University, also in printmaking. Um, I think one of the earliest uh, pieces that I did, I collaborated with a video artist named Eric Volker, uh, who, who was a huge influence on me, and, and we worked together. And um, so one of the first pieces we did together was called Thank God for TV Dinner. Um, he was interested and obsessed with media, and I was interested and obsessed with media. So media in the sense that uh, we, were, we were very involved or interested in television and television's effect on society. And so what we did for Thank God for TV Dinner was we um, set a 24-hour cycle of recording television. And then what we did with it, we didn't know what we were going to do with it. We just knew that this was part of a process for something. And then on stage, we made a projection out of that, and then we did an on-stage performance in front of the projection where we, um, we had two microwaves, two televisions, and then we had a, a chair and with cameras on us as we ate TV dinners. You know, of course, it was, it was addressing television's impact on us, you know, sort of subliminal, but also the idea of consuming the media, consuming television. And, and so in that, in that way, it became metaphoric. In 2012, I embarked on much the same process as Think Off for TV Dinner. I started to gather up footage, but all from the internet. And I edited together a, um, a video, and it turned out to be just incredibly visceral and violent. It sort of touched on all the bad shit uh, going on in society. I put together a circular frame, which was basically a projection screen. And so what I did was I projected this video piece, this montage of, of this horrible video onto the wall. And then I would hold this heavy steel frame in front of it. I would hold it as long as I could, and then I'd have to let it down. And I had, a, I had a tattoo put on my back, or on the side of my shoulder, a circle. And um, I had a, a guy standing sort of off screen, um, waiting, um, and then he had a scalpel. And so every time I held up the screen and tried to hold the weight of the world, he would come and slice into my back inside the tattoo circle. Um, and this carried on for the entirety of the, of the performance. And, and, um, you know, so there was this sense that, you know, it, it's not just heavy or hard to hold up the weight of the world. Um, there is punishment. Uh, it's emotional punishment to do such a thing. Um, I think I was sort of first interested in collage, doing lithographs in graduate school and sort of laying images over images and, and so forth. And uh, trying to create depth, certainly, within that, too. So I had a digital printer, and so suddenly um, being able to, to print on different surfaces, manipulate images, bring them in, scan them in, reprint them, and trying to de develop these pieces that had visual depth um, by putting these together and recontextualizing all this imagery and putting it onto layers, suddenly narratives within the pieces started to develop. So for me, collage is a wonderful way to take all of this pulp information or video information, news footage, magazine, whatever it is, and to pull elements out of all of that kind of stuff and recontextualize it. And, you know, we all develop a, a sort of an interpretation or understanding of our society and how we fit into it um, through media, through all of this 
information we're given on a daily basis and putting them into a different context creates a different reality. When I was 12, one of the rituals we had uh, as a family was to watch the Praise the Lord Club every night on television, followed by the news, the national news. So there was a situation in Atlanta, Georgia, where um, young children were being murdered. They went missing. Nobody knew what happened. Their bodies would be found months later, a year later. You know, eventually. Uh, there was a guy named Wayne Bertram Williams that was arrested. Uh, he was a suspect. He was, I mean, which became a media frenzy around him while he was a suspect before his arrest. Um, he was arrested. He was convicted of two of the murders, and he's doing two life sentences right now. Um, but I remember very clearly as a 12-year-old being aware that there was controversy around the, um, the conviction. I started searching the internet one day and just stumbled across, uh, across a, a website about Wayne Williams. And I read it and there was sort of this nostalgic euphoria that came over me, you know, you know how you feel those tinges sometimes. And um, so I read the whole entirety of this website and I was just reintroduced to this character that I uh, knew as a 12 year old on the news. And um, what dawned on me or surprised me was the fact that depending on what website you read, um, there was different information. So there was no string of continuity or consistency. Uh, I found it disturbing somehow. So I bought all the books. And again, they all had different information about the situation. Um, there was one book, um, it was called The List by uh, Chet Detlinger and Jeff Prue. The significance of those two is that um, they, uh, Detlinger, was uh, the assistant to the chief of police at the time in Atlanta, Georgia, where this all happened. And he quit in a rebuke of, of uh, the, how the cases were being investigated and who was involved. And he was troubled by how much the media covering the story was actually driving the truth of the story. I ended up calling Chet Dettinger and I said, Chet, listen, um, I'm doing this project. I'm, I don't know what it's going to be. Can I come down and talk with you? He said, sure. I flew down to Atlanta and I met with Chet. And we started talking about the whole thing. And I, he asked me, he said, What's, why are you so interested in this? And I said, because there's no truth. There's no truth in this whatsoever. I can't find the truth here because there's so much noise, so much clutter. He said, listen, the only way you're going to find the truth, if there is a truth, is to interview the mothers, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, the police that were involved, the medical examiners, um, the families, um, and then you're going to have to, at the end, you're going to, have to, you're going to have to get in touch with Wayne himself. And he said, that is a monumental task, and there's been multiple documentaries about the situation none of which can address it because they're trying to squash it into an hour or a half hour or a 10 minute segment. It's gonna take this broad approach and what you can end up with at the end is a very long documentation however you present it. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do that. As Chet told me, it was very important for me to get Wayne Williams on board and to, to be able to speak with him. Um, Chet gave me uh, his address, uh, well, his prison number and the prison he was at, and I wrote to him. And um, he wrote back, and we started writing to each other. And then at some stage, probably a year after letters, um, he suggested that, um, that we speak on the phone. So we then had about a, a two-year um, friendship the difficult term, but friendship over the phone. And we, sp we spoke probably twice a week. Um, and then I suggested that I come and see him in prison. And I got to come into the prison with one camera, a lapel mic, no lights, and I had no control over the environment. I got to interview Wayne for, for over an hour, asking specific questions that I wanted to. And 
we went through documents and so forth. And then once the interview was over, um, they put us out in the hallway for about an hour, just the two of us talking with no cameras or anything. And it was quite a surreal thing to sit there with this guy who'd been in my life since I was 12, really, I mean, in a weird way, uh, and actually sitting there and speaking to him for such a long time. So once I finished the whole process, a documentary became the obvious thing to do. So I put together um, a full feature-length documentary, hour and a half, um, and on the DVD um, there were extra photos, extra information, there was all this environment, a DVD environment to experience as close to the truth as I felt I could possibly get. And once I felt satisfied with that, there was an exhibition in there that would include the documentary. And one of the things that I got that nobody else has ever gotten, um, I interviewed Wayne's father before he died at his house. Spent three days there scanning in, interviewing him, scanning in their documentation, all the child photographs, even the car that the prosecution um, puts forth that killed these children in. It was there. I found the car. So um, this became the exhibition, these, these family photographs. And uh, what I ended up with, which was fantastic, were the, the photographs. His father was a photographer, and as the police were there um, gathering you know, evidence, fingerprinting, um, he photographed all of that, so I got all of those photographs. Nobody's ever had those. And so that was sort of the hinge point of the exhibition that I put up. In 2019, uh, I got an email from HBO saying that they were doing a documentary series on the subject. They wanted to buy my documentary from me because I had footage that nobody had. So they bought that off from me and then I got to fly to um, Atlanta, meet with them, and we worked through a lot of the research and all, you know, sort of figuring out all the stuff based on what they had and what I had. And, and um, so I got to participate in that process, which was fantastic. I think probably 2015 or 2016, I sort of embarked on a writing project where where I was researching serial killers and the things that they said. Reading through all that information, there were these key sentences or themes that would sort of come out of their mouths. Stuff about their families, about their childhood, their outlook on people and humanity and judgments. And they're, they're, I found that they're incredibly complicated people. So I started sort of collaging words together. and. What I ended up with was a 76-page story um, that I had collaged of specific phrases and words and sentences and paragraphs. And I realized one of the weird themes uh, of these killers was, was uh, places that they had deposited the bodies of the people they had killed. And there seemed to be this sort of theme of identifying foliage and flowers and trees with these locations that the bodies were dumped. And, and it, it dawned on me to juxtap somehow juxtapose those with flowers, because flowers are beautiful. Murder and dumping bodies is, is ugly. So what I did was I, I printed out, digitally printed out, small, small little pages of these texts of this story. And then over the top of that did flower drawings in, in colored pencil. And um, so the character that sort of emerged, I mean, if, if I often sort of work in characters, um, was, it was a serial killer that I invented named Johnny Flowers. And Johnny Flowers is obsessed with well, flowers. I suppose when looking back at, at um, all of the things I've done, I wouldn't necessarily call it a career, um, but, but it's been a journey for me, and, and it will continue till the day I die. Um, but when I sit down and think about it, my medium is not paint, it's not drawing, it's not lithography, it's not performance, it's information. So, you know, I'm an informationist. The theme that developed unconsciously, you know, 
not planned. It just sort of evolved. And that was this idea of, of working in media, creating my own media, and working with this information and deciphering it. And, and ultimately, I think, um, certainly from a religious standpoint, being brought up in a very religious family, um, this idea of absolute truth. Absolute truth. Um, I'm looking for absolute truth. But I haven't found it yet in anything. I haven't yet found it.